Kyler Murray is one of the most exciting, talented quarterbacks in the league, so why is it that the better he gets, the more his game feels like a house of cards? Could it be the annual second-half disappointment, the sheer unsustainability of some of his biggest plays, or the fact Kyler can barely see over the middle due to his height? While there have been successful quarterbacks who are comfortably below six foot, there isn't one broad brush stroke you can paint with to create the same system for all of them. Sometimes these short kings fit like a glove into the offense, and sometimes the offense has to be tailored to their very specific style of play, a style of play that can be explosive, erratic, unbelievable, and quite possibly unsustainable. The Cardinals have to play Kyler Ball to win, and this year Kyler Ball did take a major step forward statistically, even made its playoff debut, so why, despite that progress, does it feel like things could crumble at any minute? Before we answer that question, I want to shout out my friends at Built Bar. Built Bars are a protein bar that are just as healthy as they are delicious. Each individual bar has only 130 calories, 17 grams of protein, 6 grams of fiber, no preservatives, gluten-free, it's keto-friendly, and in my opinion, it's the best energy bar on the market. They have 18 different unique flavors, which taste-wise are all super good, and that begins with the smooth layer of chocolate wrapped around each of them and the awesome flavor inside of them. My favorite flavor is now the salted caramel, after I've eaten it like a million times. I'm still down with the coconut but any flavor you get is really good. I eat them for energy, for taste, as dessert, even at times at breakfast, post-workout, while I'm working, really for anything. Built Bar ships boxes right to your doorstep, and when you order, you can get a mix box, which has a bunch of different flavors, customize a box to get exactly what you want, or you can order just one flavor. To get 10% off any order, just use my coupon code AlexNFL10. To begin, we'll lay out what Kyler Ball looks like schematically, and then get into the good, and then the bad. The offense is built on his arm, and his receivers winning isolated one-on-one -on -one matchups, and then also, of course, his ability to extend with his legs when everything breaks down. The passing game attacks almost exclusively the perimeter of the field, both vertically and horizontally, where there's a constant barrage outside where Kyler's favorite routes are go balls and hitches, and then horizontally they love dialing up bubbles and smoke screens. They had the highest screen percentage in the league. This system allows DeAndre Hopkins and AJ Green to dominate outside where they can destroy corners vertically one-on-one, -on -one, and helps Christian Kirk and Rondale Moore fly around underneath by catching quick screens with plenty of space. This style helps Kyler, who can't see the middle of the field as well, since these outside-the-numbers throws have fewer coverage bodies, those guys are all in the middle, and the quick screens are also outside and more of a pre-snap read, so they're easier. The most noticeable statistical jump for Kyler in 21 was leading the league in big-time throw percentage, where he went from 20-ish the last two years to number one. Big-time throw percentage is a pro football focus stat, which they define as passes with excellent ball location and timing, generally thrown further down the field and or into a tighter window. Kyler's big-time throw percentage exploded last year, mostly because of how often he hit his alert receiver and because of his arm talent to get him the ball one-on-one. -on -one. As many of you know from this channel, alerts are almost always isolated routes that are paired with a concept on the opposite side. Here they have this dagger concept with these three receivers, which is designed for Kyler to read a receiver, and if he isn't open, he can progress to the next, but the alert doesn't really require any sort of progression. If Kyler sees he'll have a one-on-one -on -one matchup pre-snap, he can ignore the dagger concept completely knowing he has his guy just 1v1. Whenever defenses deploy just one high safety, it's almost a guarantee that A, there's single coverage outside, and B, that's where Kyler's throwing the ball. He's arguably the best alert thrower in the entire league, and defenses know it, so when they start to play off coverage over the top, the Cardinals can just run a screen and pick lots of yards up after the catch. Whenever you see D-Hop or A.J. Green winning these contested balls deep down the field, it's most likely an alert that Kyler identified pre-snap and let her rip. It doesn't take quite as much post-snap to be able to hit on these consistently, since you're relying more on arm talent, arm strength, and accuracy to complete the goes, but pre-snap can be difficult, which is an area where Kyler's kept improving. Take this example against the Seahawks, where once again Kyler is facing a one-high coverage. Pete Carroll's system often asks a linebacker to cover a vertical receiver, since in one-high coverages, the corner would have the outside, and the safety would have to choose between these two, and Kyler's able to identify that pre-snap. 
He knows even though the coverage is excellent, when a defender turns their back, they can't guard what they can't see, and this throw is money. His big-time throw percentage wasn't just the best overall, but also number one against the Blitz, which is good, but gives us some insight into where things begin to fall apart. I'm kinda cheating a bit, cause this isn't more than four pass rushers, so it's not technically a blitz, but the Cardinals have just five blockers, the Rams have six on the line, and are presenting this as an all-out blitz, man-on-man -man cover zero with this safety matching Christian Kirk, playing him about 12 yards off. The Cardinals slide four to the left to pick up these four, which leaves Joshua Jones to pick up Leonard Floyd, but when the backer comes, Kyler has to know he'll have a free runner coming right at him untouched and has to get rid of the ball immediately, aka throw hot. Kirk sight adjusts, where he cuts his route off short since there's a free runner, but instead of quickly throwing it and potentially picking up yards after the catch with two blockers for two defenders and a ton of room, Kyler uses his legs instead of his arm which works here and there, but is part of a bigger problem. When he can't throw alerts or screens, he's over-reliant on his legs to get him out of jams, which does create some unbelievable highlight reel plays, but sacrifices a lot of the down-by-down -down consistency an offense needs to function properly. Quarterbacks need to anticipate their receivers coming open at the exact right time, because NFL windows are usually open for less than a second. Kyler can make some of these wild throws on the run out of the pocket because he's one of the most gifted quarterbacks in the league, but against better competition, like in the playoffs with teams who know how to defend him better, that option gets taken away way more often, so it's critical he's hitting open receivers on time. The problem with that, though, is the elephant in the room, or I guess I'll say the mouse, Kyler can't see over the middle, and it's pretty obvious on film. Alerts and screens don't require you to read that area, but when teams start sitting on both of those, the Cardinals stall out. Off play action, they have this fake screen to the left to try and get the corner to think Antoine Wesley is blocking so he can then go deep. And then Zach Ertz is on this deep crosser with AJ Green running a deep curl. When the corner doesn't bite on Wesley running deep, Kyler comes back to Ertz who's just breaking open behind the sucked up backers and in front of the safety, but he can't see him. He hitches too many times and throws late to green, and throwing late over the middle turns into pick city. The Cardinals need to rely on the alert routes because Kyler is so good at throwing them, but they're also kind of a crutch since he can't really run a normally functioning offense. Ertz was torching the Hawks backup safety Josh Jones the entire game, but Kyler is predetermining before the snap he'll throw this alert hitch, and you can see that Ertz is not happy, and this is not the only time. Statistically, Kyler actually gets worse the closer to the line of scrimmage the receiver is, and that's because of his desire to constantly target the deep alerts, which he hits a lot of them, and because his feet are always getting antsy to roll out and throw to a receiver screaming deep across the field instead of sitting inside the pocket. When you're not throwing on time underneath, you can't really play underneath since the windows are so minuscule, and if you're constantly throwing deep outside or moving your feet in the pocket trying to figure out where to run, you won't be able to punish defenses at every opportunity, like in the wild card game against the Rams. Through the first 20 minutes, the Cardinals had a total of negative four offensive yards, and though there were some opportunities over the middle, Kyler couldn't capitalize. They're running a drive concept, which is a shallow route and dig route behind it, which is designed to stretch out this linebacker. If he sits back on the dig, Kyler can hit the shallow, and if he comes up for the shallow, Kyler hits Ertz on the dig. Ertz is excellent at settling into these holes in zone coverage, but Kyler's feet aren't settled, he can't see over the middle, and his timing is all messed up. He's always been the most athletic on the field, the fastest, the quickest, so instead of sitting in one spot like he needs to in this clean pocket, his footwork is antsy, frantic, looking to move even when he shouldn't. I believe some of these footwork issues fall on Cliff Kingsbury, since these issues with Kyler haven't gotten better over their three years together, but also because of Cliff's propensity to design offenses that are fairly unsophisticated, he hasn't made the necessary mid-season adjustments, so defenses have pretty clearly been figuring out his offense midway through every season for, like, a long time. This year, the Cardinals started 7-0 and got to 10-2 before they lost five of their last six, and going back through Cliff's history, even back to his time at Texas Tech in college, like all the way back to 2013, if you combine his entire history, in games one through seven of each season, he has a 666 winning percentage, but the rest of the year, it plummets all the way down to 271. Teams clearly have a knack for figuring him out, 
and I'll speak to just his time with the Cardinals, a good chunk of that also falls onto the shoulders of Kyler. He has his own brand of offense that Cliff needs to acquiesce to, and there are a lot of things Cliff wants to do, but can't do that would help the Cardinals win games. He can't call concepts over the middle, because Kyler won't see him, so he won't throw him. He can't ask Kyler to sit in the pocket too long, because he won't get the explosive extend the plays. And he can't really scheme up specific defenders throughout the game, because Kyler doesn't play within the framework of the offense. The Cardinals are extremely good at this brand of offense with alerts, deep shots, screens, and extending the play. And the problem is, Kyler is so good at those things, they just made the playoffs, so there's almost no way to teach him how to play otherwise. This brand of ball does work, it's just super challenging to create any kind of consistency out of it. So when Cliff, Kyler, and the Cardinals get to the playoffs with the big boys, they don't have any sort of foundation to rely on. With the fourth-year quarterback potentially holding out for an extension, a coach that has fallen apart in the second half of every year for nearly a decade, and a general uneasiness surrounding the team, moving forward, Kyler Murray and the Cardinals will be good, but will they ever be great? This